Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Um, so today I will be talking about uh, participation, um, understood mostly in the context of Barfield and his work, Saving the Appearances. Um, so this will be a very just brief attempt to begin a conversation around what his idea of final participation might be, what living it would imply, and some, I present some strategies and ideas for how we might enter back into conscious participatory relation with the world around us. So, this sounds interesting to me, but why should you care? Um, well, it is characteristic of our phenomena, says Barfield, that our participation in them, and therefore also in their representational nature, is excluded from our immediate awareness. Yet just because phenomena are often excluded from our awareness does not mean that we cease to participate in them. Participation does not cease to be a fact because it ceases to be conscious. But it does cease to be conscious because we neglect it and cease to give it the kind of attention it requires. As things stand, humans are, by and large, active, unknowing participants in a world they consider largely inert and other. And while it is said that ignorance is bliss, in this case, ignorance is highly dangerous for humans, changeable, whismical, impulsive, mystical, powerful, self-centered, and generous humans are constantly interacting with a world they believe to be immutable, imperviable to their interaction, largely mechanical and regulated by unmoving laws. In short, in, with a world they believe to exist and change independently from their actions, beliefs, and conceptions. This is a tricky place to be. We are seeing all around us the dire results of unconscious participation in the form of the various crises, environmental, social, economic, and even spiritual. Unconscious participation and its correlative belief that we are completely isolated individuals results in our alienation from the world, from each other, and even from ourselves. Alienation that separates us and provides the fuel for the rapid spreading of the crisis of meaning which burns underneath so many of the predicaments we face today. So what would happen if we made our participation conscious again? If we shifted into perceiving the world as a living, evolving agent, desirous to be wooed by the power of our longing to be in relationship with it. I don't pretend to fully know what final participation is, nor how to achieve it, but I am hoping that by sharing my own understanding of participation and some of the strategies that I use to fall into loving relationship with the world, I can open up a conversation for us to think in community about this. So what is participation? Most of us probably have some intuition about what participation means, for even if we are not consciously aware of it, we all participate in the world. Being alive itself is an act of participation. And while this relationship can now seem sort of obscured and contrived, at almost all points in history before modernity, it was recognized that it was only by virtue of participation that humans could claim to have any being. I, in the company of many pre-modern thinkers, would go even further and claim in the metaphysics of participation that it is by virtue of participation that not just humans, but that all creatures can claim to have any being. For, and I think this is key, it is not just humans that participate, but all plants and animals, and even what we consider to be inert matter, such as rocks and wind and earth, participate, though each according to its own capacity. This belief that by nature of, exi of things existing, they participate, is nothing new, yet it is nonetheless radical. For the moment one truly believes that, is the moment one changes from seeing the world as dead material to beholding it in all its verdant, exuberant, and living beauty. In a sense, we are the first period in history to be almost completely unaware of our participation. Before the advent of Greek reason 
and Hebrew revelation, most of the world, at least, Barfield claims, existed in a state of original participation, where all of life and where life and agency was not only not limited to man, but was considered as residing primarily outside of man. This was a world dominated not by human beings, but by phenomena. The Greeks, even though they're well past the primal state, still retained an intuition of this kind of participation, which deeply informed their philosophy and mythology. It was also even present with a distinctly Christian flavor in the medieval period. It was not until the scientific revolution, really, that the last remaining traces of this original participation were sort of wiped out. Today, as a society, we are caught between these two stages of participation, that one which was, and I believe the one which is to come. In many ways, the scientific revolution can be seen as sort of the belly of the whale, um, the farthest point collectively from original participation. And while you know, it might have been sometimes dark in there, it was also really necessary. For from that night of the scientific revolution, we emerged with a strong sense of self, of identity, a knowledge of the value of us as an individual, and an understanding of the process of individuation, and the capacity to protect our own agency and not be perpetually at the mercy of whatever phenomenon choose to, chose to cr cross our path. And while we are most definitely still deep in the belly, it can be argued by nature of us having this conversation and probably hundreds more like it, that we're beginning to emerge. Participation is being brought to the fore again, yet this participation will necessarily be different from original participation. For we are not the same species we were several thousand years ago. We have become strong in our selfhood, and as such, we need a participation that incorporates and does not negate our individuation. One that recognizes the difference and uniqueness of each and every inhabitant of the world, yet also recognizes the deep sameness that runs through them, through us. A participation where things are not forced, but rather actively choose to enter into relationship with one another. This point, simultaneous recognition of the inherent individuality and sameness of things, say of nature and humans, of divine and creation, of male and female, of self and other, of paradox, this paradox and singularity engaged always in beautiful tension is at the core of my own understanding of participation. So we currently live, by and large, in a world that is mostly differentiated. Our language is literal, or at least made up of primarily dead and dying metaphors. Um, our reason is presented most of the time as the only way of knowing, and mind its only organ. And most people imagine humans as the only beings with agency. Original participation was in many ways, though not all, the opposite of this. There was an emphasis on absolute sameness. Language was symbolical. And the exp an experience was believed to be the prime way of knowing. And then all things were recognized as having agency, including many beings we don't even recognize today, such as spirits and angels, etc. Yet I'm not arguing for a return to original participation. I do not think that state is desirable anymore. Neither is it realistic. We've come too far forward to simply go back to that. Rather, I think that the kind of participation that awaits requires a uniting of these two perspectives, the modern and original participation, if you will, not by fusing and synthesizing and finding a middle ground, but rather by being able to hold both of these perspectives fully and simultaneously, thereby transcending the dichotomies and breaking the, down the polarities. We need to walk not a spectrum between them, but a path that is at once both and neither. For the essence of participation we are moving towards seems to me to be one of holding together in one perspective and one being things which up to this moment seem utterly different. 
literal and symbolic, internal, external, domestic and wild, acting and being acted upon. It is the learning to live in and with the paradox, with the tension. The task ahead, I think, is to learn to hold all of these in unity, not by fusing them with one another, but holding each in their fullness and together in perfect coexistence. In this, we are pushed to become the embodiment of opposites, the union of difference, the mediator between two polarities and the bridge between them. We are pushed to see a world where the fire of the divine shines from both within and without us. So how do we overcome the current fragmentation? How do we move towards that? Well, one of the paths that I would like to suggest involves several things. The returning, the retraining of our perception and attention, the exploding of our language, the tapping into the power and magic of words and names, and the apprenticing of, of ourselves to myths and stories and the world around us. Well, no doubt there are many other methods, and I would love to see what you all um, come up with. These are the ones that are most alive for me, and so that's um, the ones I would love to address. So, Barfield states that on almost all theories of perception, the familiar world, that is, the world which is apprehended not through instruments and inferences, but simply, is for the most part dependent on the percipient. This is a key insight. What we perceive is not something absolute, but rather something that is dependent on us, dependent on what we choose to give our attention to and the frameworks and assumptions we bring to that. Thus, who we are and how we behold affects not only our interpretation of the phenomena, but determines in a way the very phenomena we see. This is what Barfield calls figuration, or the method through which we assimilate internally the external world, how we construct meaning through the information we receive. And I think this figuration has tremendous power. For by bringing awareness to the process of perception and figuration, how we behold and make sense of the world, we can directly influence the world around us. And I don't mean this in a purely idealistic way. We are constantly receiving the data of our experience. But it is up to us what we do with that data. We can assimilate it, ignore it, sort it, interpret it, or we can turn it into meaning. And this is the key. We can always choose to turn more and more data into meaning. And this can have profound effects. For usually when we have more meaning, we tend to evolve hopefully in a positive direction. And because of the beautiful, complex interconnections of the world, the more we evolve, the more we affect those around us. And they begin to evolve, which affects us, which affects everything that we are in contact with, everything we have chosen to be in relationship with. This happens because the world is fundamentally relational, because we are not isolated but deeply embedded in webs of community and reciprocity. And given the participatory nature of reality, it makes sense that my evolution affects the whole world even if I don't touch it. For we are all in a relationship of co-evolution with the cosmos, and so our evolution ripples out into eternity. Barfield acknowledges this. He says that the actual evolution of the Earth as we know it must have been at the same time an evolution of consciousness, for consciousness is correlative to phenomenon. Which means, I think, that if the way we perceive changes the, that which is perceived, and if the evolution of the Earth is dependent on phenomena, and these phenomena are manifested differently based on the quantity and quality of our attention, and if it is consciousness that determines the content of our observations, then our perception of the world really directly affects and shapes physical reality. And there is a fundamental change in our understanding of ourselves, of reality, and of our relationship when we change the way we perceive, figure, and understand matter. 
it is very different to conceptualize the movement of an inert rock as falling down a mountain being caused by an impersonal constant and indifferent force, gravity, than to conceptualize it as a stone aspiring to reach its natural place at the center of the universe and rushing because of the strength of its desire more fervently the nearer it came to home. Understanding the same thing, a stone moving in such vastly different ways, changes the way we feel about that being, in this case a stone, and thus changes the depth of the relationship we think um, or want to have with it. So what I'm saying is that how you perceive the world and how you expect to see it determines what you see. It determines how likely you are to see the rest of a world as alive and involved in participation. If all you expect to see is a dead and indifferent machine, then that is exactly what you will limit yourself to behold. The other crucial shift in perspective is the shift back into realizing that thinking and perceiving are not things we do in our minds, but rather they are things we do in the world. Thought and perception have spatial dimensions to them. Uh, we are not in a vacuum. We are in space, and thus, place has something to teach us. When we recuperate the spatial dimension of our perception, we are able to not only think about the land, but to think with the land. We can recognize the wisdom we carry in the bones and the wisdom that sits in places, in trees, in rivers, in bushes, in mountains, in bends. This change into thinking with will be a big development for society. It can be conceived of, conceived of as a shamanic initiation for modernity, for it gives us the capacity to travel between the worlds, in this case, the world viewed from within ourselves and the world viewed from the land. And this traveling back and forth requires us to be both deeply attached and detached from our general experience of perception, so that we can be simultaneously looking out into a situation and be aware of the situation looking back at us. It is the realization that in every act of perception, we are also being perceived. And we can become proficient at moving back and forth between these two and perhaps many other worlds, proficient at shifting our perspectives, yet always with the goal of bringing back knowledge for healing as a gift and as a blessing to others. So how do we solidify and share this transformation? Well, through our language. Language is extremely powerful, for not only can it itself determine the world around us, it can also intimately reflect and qualify our experience of it. The way we name something qualifies what the thing is. Through language, Barfield says, we come without effort to share in the collective representations of our own age and our own community. Language provides a frame for our beholding. You cannot see something you cannot name. Yet our common language today, and thus our mind, is poorly equipped to share in participation, for it is so heavily skewed towards the simple and the literal that there is little place left for mystery, for complexity, for ambiguity and symbolism within it. This simplicity takes a dimension of numinosity away from the world. Our clothes are prosaic because our minds are literal. In this state, there's little space for the sacred to move around in us, around us. We have scoured much beauty from our language. We have sanitized it, sterilized, sterilized it, and rendered it purely informative, without the capacity for greater meaning. And the co-creation that can happen between speaker and listener and context when all three are simultaneously creating. We are constantly trying to control our language, to constrain it, to define it, and so we don't let it have its own mystery, and thus we strip it of its power, and so it dies, and the world dies with it. So what can we do about that? We can explode our language, we can stretch it into places it is no longer used to going. We can break down the neat categories of literal and metaphorical that we are so used to, and use it in a way that transcends all such division. This means rewilding our language. 
It means remembering that our words are echoes of nature herself sounding in man, or rather that they are echoes of what one sounded and fashioned both of them at the same time. Through language, we are constantly reminded of the birth of the universe, and through eloquent speaking, we can constantly participate in its creation. Words are the link through which we participate directly in the phenomena and the primary tools with which, with which we build relationships with each other and with the more than human world. It is said that names are the only true knowledge, for naming something requires our identification, our intimate involvement with it. Phenomenon, says Barfield, the phenomenon itself only achieves full reality in the moment of being named by man. That is, when that in nature which is represented is united with that in man which the name represents. So naming breaks down the inner and outer dichotomy by forcing us to acknowledge the links through which we are tied and intertwined with the world around us. Through naming, we become at once the representer and the represented. Through naming, we forge relationships. We speak them into existence. In the beginning was the word. Speaking is thus far from being a purely functional phenomenon, and we should stop treating it as such. If done in full consciousness, speaking is a primary act of creation. This is why storytellers, people whose eloquence is their currency, are important. They often carry the wild language we have long tamed, and they carry within them the stories and myths we need to pave the doorway back into participation. Stories and myths that can both quench our despair and fuel our longing, for they contain within them glimpses of other realities, other worlds, and thus other possibilities. They show us a different way of being in the world, one, often, in which participation is common, and the split between inner and outer and literal and metaphorical is non-existent. When we live in myth, it could be argued, we are transported immediately to living in participation. Thus, myths and stories are fundamental, for they can serve as a bridge between a participated and a non-participated reality. They can even serve as roadmaps to the territory. And here I would just want to have a little caveat that I'm not talking about myths in like, and working with them in like a Jungian way. For all the respect I have for Jungians and their mythic interpretation, I think they are fundamentally missing something because myths are much more powerful and infinitely larger than our own psyches. Myths, some, especially the old and the deep ones, don't even belong to humans alone. Myths are the power of a place speaking. They are the cosmos itself speaking. So myths can be a mediator, a translator, between the worlds we conceive with our mind and the world we perceive with our senses. They're a platform to explore the human relationship to a world that is ensouled and can replace the Greek middle voice as the in-between place where acting and being acted upon coexist. The future of the phenomenal world, says Barfield, can no longer be regarded as independent of man's volition. And we can no longer claim ignorance to shield us. We are at a unique point when for the first time we recognize the power of human volition and understand that we are actively shaping the future we will live into. There is tremendous power and potential in that. And it also comes with massive moral requirements. With our actions, perceptions, and speech, we are constantly rebirthing the world. Our words are alive and carry magic and power in them. So we require an ethics of eloquence. We require that we remember the true names of things and speak in the beauty of the creation of the world. Then, the recognition of the breakdown of the dichotomies as they are held in tension requires requires us to recognize not only the fundamental difference we hold with the rest of creation, which we are well acquainted with, but to much more radically recognize also the deep sameness. 
And this carries, again, sweeping ethical implications for the basic logic with which we justify so much of our exploitation of the world would simply not hold. The recognition of kinship would force us to rethink fundamentally who we are, who nature is, and who we are in relationship to each other. The plain fact is, Barfield states, that all the unity and coherence of nature depends on participation of one kind or another. If therefore man succeeds in eliminating all original participation without substituting any other, he will have done nothing less than to eliminate all meaning and coherence from the cosmos. That's a heavy statement. Um, so we have a responsibility to come back into participation, but more than a responsibility, like a duty, a necessity, because according to that, our very survival and the cohesion of the cosmos is tied to us learning to pay intimate attention to the mysteries of the world around us, to apprentice ourselves to the world and to recognize the agency of all elements. Then we can carefully try to lure Pan back from behind his closed doors. But how do we know what to create? What direction to unfold in? Well, with the movement into part back into participation, I want to suggest that the capacity, uh, the capacity not only to think about the rest of creation, but to think with it is key. We are not alone. We have a whole world full of beings who are desirous to have a say in the direction of our collective destiny. We can learn to listen. We can learn to enter into conversation with the world and its creator. For if the sameness we share extends downward into the earth, then logically it would also need to extend upwards into the heaven, suggesting we can try to be in relation to the divine mind itself. When we do that, when we enter into relationship with everything that is below us, above us, and around us, then and only then, as Barfield says, will the whole cosmos of wisdom, with all its forgotten truths, dwell in us. Yet that is a lofty goal, and it will take a lot of time to achieve. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, we can swallow the heart of the world, we can learn to speak with the eloquence of stars and be guided always in our creation by the beauty we perceive all around. Thank you. Space for the sacred to move around in cycles. Storytellers carry the wild language we have long tamed. Our myths are the power of a place to see them. But it won't fit again. Um, just thinking of that stone, it makes me think of the way that Stan Rothwood's, his patient experience as a baby, really, really pushing to get out of the room. And he goes to the material scientists and they say, What are you talking about? And you go back and say, well, that just was the subjective experience of what was going on. And so just as you can look at the stone from a scientific perspective and say that's just reality at work, there's a difference between that and the actual um, internal experience that was taking place. Yeah, or like I like what Brian, how Brian conceptualizes gravity often as just the pure arrows, the desire of something wanting to be next to something else. Like, that seems to be like a much more powerful pull of like this attraction, this love. That is what binds things together, not just something that pulls you, you know, force that pulls you down to the earth. Um. I think Alan Barfield would be delighted by your talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think he would be absolutely thrilled. And for lots of reasons. First of all, you have it. You understand it and you spoke it beautifully. But Alan Barfield himself couldn't do what he did. He would say, uh, he stuttered. 
Uh, and he had almost no drama in his speech. So no of the beautiful gestures that you made that invited us to participate. He wrote gorgeously, but only if you had a, an intellect to appreciate mid 20th century high class British. Uh, so he was, people learned from him, rose to that level, but he wasn't able to popularize. Mm. In fact, he didn't have a professorial position, probably because he studied. So what, what, by making it so graceful, and so by the end, serious and urgent, um, I think he would be just very grateful to you. It's, uh, his work continues. I mean, he continues in Jake as well, of course. But Jake, to you, it's quite wonderful to observe. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's something that needs to be said. Like, if I'm speaking about language and the importance of language, it's the minimum I could do to try to make, you know, if I'm arguing for something, I might as well try to at least sort of embody it. But he had the whole, all of Shakespeare and, and Blake and Coleman running through his mind right. at all times. But we have another task, and that's the one you updated. Let me just add, people don't know Colin uh, Buffett. Um, so in the mid 90s, I sent him something that I had written uh, that was related to him. And he wrote back at 95 a, uh, a handed letter that mm -hmm. you've seen uh, complimenting CIIS as one of the bright places uh, in the world that is, uh, uh, so it has too few such bright places. It's something very complimentary like that. So we're all, in a certain sense, one of the people we're following, um, even people who don't know that we're following, uh, we're following them about it. Yeah. There's a lot that you can offer. Wonderful. It's a thrilling presentation. Alice? Well, I particularly, I liked everything, but I particularly liked your description of myth and its role and why it exceeds what uh, Jung was doing. I had the opportunity to study myth a little bit, and I just love that you brought that out, because it really does have to do with the relationship of participation. And we kind of rejected myth because we keep projecting it backward in time. But the truth is, is that like when you go out and walk out here, you're creating your own myths because your own perceptions of relationship and this and that. You know, you don't have to anthropomorphize it. You don't have to bring it into the world of little beings or people or anything, unless you see them, of course. But I just think that, you know, myth needs to be acknowledged more, and I love that you said that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. No, and I think it's like, myths carry a lot of psychic weight, or they can be psychic containers. But if we only assign to it human psyche, like that greatly limits the capacity of what they can carry. And then we have very few containers where we can really carry the psyche of the things around us. And so I don't think myths are the only thing, but they're one that we already have. So how can we just use them more to carry these things that need to be carried? Because otherwise they'll be lost. And as we can see with a lot of myths that have come down to us, sometimes we get just the bare bones because we've stripped it of almost all the other agents in it. And so it's the bare bones. And we can reflesh it out, but it takes a lot of work. It's really fun luggage for what your experiences are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ashley? Oh, Ashley. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, Mary Lou is beautiful. And I, I just want to say, um, you may be many things, but you are a poet, I feel. And I just want to name that, since you're empowering me to do things. <laughs> um, and I also want to just uh, uh, give my testimony that uh, the tension I felt um, between what you call the, the original participation, is it modern participation? or it's Well, um, the language Barfield uses is final, final. participation. Which, yeah. And you 
what I heard was that it's not really so much a synthesis as it is holding both uh, and dealing with both. Uh, and where I went to with that was just kind of this attorney and practicality. And mm -hmm. I think about you know, how do we actually move and act and you know, get our food and our water and our energy and things like that. And I, it's something I struggle with personally is using tools. It's a messy process, and I guess um, I struggle with it, and uh, I feel I really have mastered uh, that that sort of holding of attention. And I wonder, I wonder how you live with it. Um, so I think for me, one of the things that like really, I mean, I'm still learning. First of all, but one of the things that really attracts me is this idea of like the paradox. I feel like especially. In this day and age, we are very prone to just be like, oh, it has to be either this or that. You know, it's white or it's black. But yet, that seems too strict, and there's very s little space for creativity when you live in like such strong categories. Um, but I think in the paradox, like when you try to hold both of those, when you have that tension, that tension generates creativity, and I think a lot of the really new things that we can bring forth is not from just inventing a new category, but it's like, but we have a lot of things out there. So for me, it's this practice of how can I hold it, how both of these things in my mind, both of whatever things, and not try to just make one win absolutely over the other and hold them and hold them and hold them and hold them until eventually like something breaks through, something explodes from between them. Um, and then it's like, okay, maybe I follow that. And then you find this. And so it seems like a burst of creativity that come from the holding and the creating of that maybe Saturnian like structure and container so that something can burst forth. Ashton? Um, I really like when you said our clothes are prosaic because our language is literal. And so I, I, that wasn't my clothes, that was part of Oh, okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. that. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm just curious what you might have to say about um, just the aesthetic of every day. And also in relation to the paradox, which we were just talking about, um, that in relation to your intentions, eloquence like walking through the streets of San Francisco learning into what you will and just how to hold that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question and we're all still figuring it out. Uh, for the first part, the, um, like the prosaic and the literal, at least say in terms of clothes, like, I think this, say, is a great example. So like this was woven by someone, right? It was it has a tradition behind it. And so it's, it's not the same for me as just like wearing a whatever shirt. Because it's here, it's like, well, I'm, by wearing something like this, I'm automatically in relation to someone else, to a woman, in this case, in like uh, the Chiapas region of Mexico who was weaving this, who has her own cosmology that she's weaving into the fabric. And so I might never talk to her, but like by just wearing it and interchanging it through a material thing, we can sort of absorb each other. And so then it's, you know, clothes are no longer prosaic or the aesthetic of everyday life is no longer prosaic. Like if you, if there's a human imprint on it, you can start to see how it contains someone's world, someone's actions, someone's love. Um, so I think it's, it might be a lot of that, but then moving away from like just the industrial pre-made to something that someone actually cared for. Um, and then, so the second part of your question was around the ethics of eloquence? Or? Well, yeah, I think... I'm just thinking about... Um, uh, like the paradox that you, were, you two were just discussing, and um, 
through this vision that you're talking about, um, where like one's attention to the land especially is very important. And then also, I, I, don't, I guess what I mean is when uh, walking through the streets of San Francisco where there's like so much suffering, um, how do you comport yourself there? Um, especially, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to phrase it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I have any good answer to that question. Um, but I think, say, in this day and age, and with the current government that is in this country, like there, there's a very reduced eloquence and vocabulary. And, and so I think maybe part of that like ethics of eloquence is like, well, maybe we have a duty to keep alive these other words, these other concepts, to bring them forth into conversation all the time and not just be dominated by you know, someone whose vocabulary ranges in you know, the third is the same as a like third grader, because we can do so much more, because we can see so much more, because we can expand um, what we're thinking about. So like maybe that can be just a constant challenge of like I refuse to just fall into the way everyone speaks. You know, like I can be like an act of resistance to be like I will learn and I will be eloquent and I will choose the words carefully and play with them because that can lead to a very real change. Like I think that can be a form of activism. Yeah, and I think then, am I just time for one more question? Because I think then it's Sophia's turn. I don't have a question so much as a comment. Yes. Um, I was just reflecting back on what Brian said last week about like what is the most events with where Sheldon was speaking and he said or he responded to Brian's question that um, you know Brian asked him like you know what did he think about what you had said and he said we well, didn't say anything and I'm thinking like how much of our language is just empty of like actual meaning and it's just about conveying concrete information and I just want to thank you for bringing some aliveness to our language. Uh, I just had a question. Or you mentioned um, middle voice, a yeah. Greek middle voice, and it seems appropriate for language and covering what's important. And I was just curious if you like could say a little bit more about what you meant because you just said it once. Yeah. And so it. I mean, maybe someone who actually knows Greek <laughs> would be a better <laughs> to answer that question. But from what I understand it, is um, they have this like I guess verb tense where it's it's both in English. It's very much like subject, like, I am doing this, right? Like, I, pull it, I pushed this thing over. The thing didn't push itself over the way it is sometimes in other languages. In Spanish, you can say, like, oh, the thing sort of fell by itself. Um, and I think the Greek middle voice it was a, uh, a verb tense where both, you could hold that tension of, like, something being both an actor and being acted upon, both like acting and receiving at the same time. Um, so it, that just seems to be something really rich that I wish we could um, get back on. Thank you.